Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Today, we'd like to welcome everyone, uh, clients and friends to Fluent Financial's June 2022 webinar. Obviously, we're going to be talking about what's been going on in the markets. Uh, it's been a, a horrible year to say the least. There has been a safe place to put money. Uh, stock market's been down, so has the bond market. But we're going to talk about what what's causing this, what may happen, what we're waiting for, and more importantly, what we're doing to protect your money. And joining me on the call today will will be uh, Mike Lanise. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we decided to have Mike do his weekly market update. We probably need to change this to say monthly. Uh, well, my, Mike will give an update uh, once a month about what's going on. Um, some people have wanted the weekly, but it seems most people would prefer to look at it monthly. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Mike and kind of give an uh, overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Thanks, Mitch. Hi, everyone. Um, if you guys could please hit mute on your microphone for us. Um, I'm getting a little bit of background feedback, um, so that'd be appreciated if you could do that. So, okay, uh, for those of you that have been on these before with us, we like to show what the markets are doing. And this shows through yesterday. And then if you include today, markets are down, S&P was down over 3% today. So these numbers all took an additional hit today after that little bounce that you see um, when rates were raised yesterday. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is Mitch just alluded to, um, US equities are, are feeling the pressure of the highest inflation since 1981. So we have the June 10th, which was Friday this last week where the CPI numbers um, were stronger than, um, stronger than thought, we thought, uh, peak inflation had been turning over and it turns out they went back up again. This is again, the consumer pricing index. Um, so that's kind of spooked the market and it also somewhat spooked the Fed with the PPI numbers out, which are the producer inflation numbers on Monday. And so um, they ended up raising interest rates yesterday, 75 basis points, which is three quarters of a percent. A typical move would be 25 basis points. So the fact that they did three means means they're definitely feeling the pressure of, of an inflationary market. We'll talk a little bit about the, the Russian Ukraine and uh, the invasion of Ukraine from Russia and how that's continuing to uh, be a headwind for markets. And then what we are anticipating going forward. All right. So Mike, let's talk a bit about how our portfolios have performed against uh, the overall indices. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think your best apples to apples comparison on here is if you look at your S&P 500 year to date number down just about 20%. Again, this was through yesterday. So you're going to see in anybody watching markets today that did not include that 20% or more is a bear market. We are now in bear market territory from the January 3rd high. Um, also, if you look at our VNO, that's our stock portfolio down just over 23%. So getting hit a little bit harder than the S&P is getting hit right now, um, but still pretty close in line there. Um, another thing, you know, Mitch just said it, there's really no place to hide. Energy has done well this year, but look what the bonds are doing. The, the total aggregate bond market is down almost 12% on the year. Typically when, when stocks go down, bonds are a safe place and vice versa. It's not really happening this time. So. That's uh, somewhat important to point out. Yeah. I think another important point is that uh, we made a decision to do some uh, rebalancing in the VNO and ADVP portfolio earlier this week. And we increased the cash in VNO from 9% to 15 and also increased cash in ADVP. And uh, we think those changes are going to be beneficial. We will talk a little bit about a capitulation event, and that's kind of the bottom when the market st starts to go back up, and we're much closer to that point now than we were a month or two ago. So let's talk a little bit about how bad the, the stock and the bond market has been. And if you look at this slide here, if you look at the uh, year-to-day performance for stocks, and this is through uh, May 31st, the market's obviously gone down more since the end of May, and the bond market has gone down. 
And if you look at this, there's only been three instances where both the stock and the bond market were negative uh, for the year. 31, the Great Depression, 69, the Vietnam War, and then this year, 18, the bond market was basically flat. So there hasn't really been a safe place to hide. I guess the exception could be your houses and real estate, but that's not a liquid asset unless you have uh, rental property. Um, and that's one of the reasons why institutional investors have kind of flooded that space. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about is inflation starting to roll over. On this particular slide here, you can see kind of the peaks about a month or so ago, and then core, uh, core inflation actually came in at 8.6. It was supposed to come in at 8.2, and that's what spooked the markets last week. I think it was also a big impetus for the Fed raising rates, 75 basis points versus 50. However, PPI came in a little bit lower. Um, so maybe we're, we're kind of at peak inflation. Um, we'll know here as time goes on. Mike, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, to point out when a lot of our inflation, there's good news here. The good news is that a lot of this inflation is because the underlying uh, food and energy prices, Biden claimed a war against fossil fuels when he took office and his policies are reflecting that. And that's why you see that big run up in inflation. Then you see Russia invade Ukraine, and that exacerbated the situation, but it's really policies that, that are going on that are causing gas prices to be so high and that underlying everything else that's going on. The good news I'm trying to say is that can be changed. I don't think this administration is going to change it, but it's kind of self-induced. We were energy independent going into this new administration. So it just depends on how much pain the voters are willing to take, I think, at this point. And to further carry on to the oil and gas, this is production versus consumption. And we've done some highlighting here. Um, the production areas up here, you see 19, 20, 21, and 22, and then 23, you see this growth here. Then you see consumption. And what you'll notice is that consumption for 21 and 22 uh, is going to be greater than the production. 23, it's going to uh, reverse. And you can see down here the number of active rigs is increasing. This dark line here represents the strategic reserve in the, in the Biden administration has released oil from that. It's been more of a window dressing and having a material effect. We're not going to have time to go into this subject this month. We'll probably address it next month. And it's something called ESG investing, in environmental, social, and governmental. And there was a very good documentary uh, Tucker Carlson interviewed uh, Marlo Oates, who is the uh, state treasurer for Utah. I recommend those of you who have uh, Fox Nation to watch it. But ESG is being weaponized to basically punish industries that people in the government do not like. And they're basically trying to kill capital and investment in a sector that re really needs it. The other factor of it, you see uh, very uh, progressive boards or board members, uh, engine number one, specifically for ExxonMobil, had a couple of people elected and they basically forced ExxonMobil to cancel two natural gas plants. But the problem with this is it's basically the Green New Deal they couldn't get through the front door is getting ramrodded through the back door through ESG investing criteria. And another part of it is S&P has credit ratings on, in terms of your bond prices, how much it costs to borrow. What now S&P's come out with is an ESG rating. And ESG is very subjective. It can be anything they want it to be. But if you have a poor ESG rating, your borrowing costs go up significantly. And, and the other area you see this mm -hmm. in is a lot of your big pension funds are forbidding the investment in the fossil fuel industry. So look at Capers in California, the New York, uh, Illinois, primarily blue state pension funds, they prohibit investing in the fossil fuel sector. And at a time, if capital could be adequately deployed, these guys and gals can make lots of money in the sector, but they can't get the capital they need. And the other problem we have is the permitting issue. They say, oh, we've got you know, all these areas of land and, um, that people can drill on, but then they're slow walking the permits. Uh, instead of taking a month or two to get a permit, some of my, my buddies in West Texas, it takes up to a year now. But this is a huge problem that could easily be reversed. It's not going to happen overnight. But I, I just don't think uh, the current administration has the stomach to make the changes we need. 
But what this means for all of us on this call, this $115, $120 barrel oil is going to be with us for some time. And we have a slide we'll talk about here in the future about things that could change and make things better. But so much of our economy revolves around the price of fossil fuel. It's going to be hard to get inflation under control when these uh, energy prices remain elevated when they should be probably 20 or 30 percent lower. So, yeah. Mitch, I'm looking at the 2023 U.S. production rate at 21.5 versus in 2019, it was 19.5. Yeah. Well, what did we have an epiphany? We, we decided to throw a bunch of refineries online and start producing more between 2019 and now. I don't think so. So I'm not quite sure where that number is coming from. And I feel like it's wishful thinking. Yeah. And again, that that's speculative. And I know the CEO for Chevron came out recently and said he doesn't anticipate that a refinery ever be built again in this country. And we'll talk about that uh, here next. And talking about refineries, we've not built one of any size over $100,000 barrel per day capacity since you know 1976 or 77. 200,000. And a lot of the refineries are, are being uh, reconditioned to you know, produce biofuel and more ethanol. And, and it becomes a challenge. And then if you think it's difficult to get a permit to drill an oil well, what do you think the likelihood is that the EPA is going to grant a license to build a multi-billion dollar refinery? Highly unlikely. And then the other issue you have is who wants a refinery in their backyard? You've got the NIMBY, not in my backyard scenario. So this is, is creating a, a potential bottleneck in, in the Green New Deal. People have got to be ecstatic. But all of us consumers are paying the price for this wishful thinking. Everyone wants cleaner air, water. Uh, we want to get there, but we can't get there overnight. There has to be a transitionary period. So if we get rid of fossil fuels, we don't have enough wind or solar to replace fossil fuels. And no one wants to have the discussion about how do we transition to that. And it's very, very frustrating. And those of you out in West Texas know a lot more about this than, than we do, but it's very, very frustrating. And it's going to keep prices, unfortunately, elevated. So if you look at the capa uh, capacity utilization of the refineries, uh, the blue line is going to be weekly. It's jumpy. And the five-year average is the orange and the 10-year average is the gray. These numbers should be much higher, but they're much lower. And we can't produce as much oil and our diesel fuel dis distillates and gasoline to keep up with demand. Thus, prices are, are much higher. And this next slide here kind of shows kind of the same information. But what's really dis uh, dis uh, uh, disconcerting, you see this blue line here, it's actually trending down. That's going to pull down the five and 10 year average when we need to be producing more. Um, but again, this administration has gone on the record and they do not want fossil fuels to be around. You know, this ESG issue came to a front for this uh, for Marlowe when he reached out to his counterpart at West Virginia. And the West Virginia state treasurer said the banks have cut off financing for their coal and oil production. So the bank said, ah, we can't lend you the state of West Virginia anymore because of ESG rules. So you're seeing this uh, restriction of capital when it's really needed. And the, the, the Biden administration, they don't care. Um, this next slide has talked about some of the repercussions of the Ukraine-Russia war. If you look at the pre-invasion, you know, Russia is here in yellow. They were exporting a lot of oil to uh, China, but primarily Europe. We were self-sufficient, and South America was sending oil to India and China. Now, after the invasion, the Europeans are basically, we don't want Russian oil. They're wanting oil from us. And Russia says, fine, you don't want our oil. We'll be happy to sell all of it to India and China. And what's really interesting is we thought this would crush the Russian ruble and economy. Putin is ecstatic. He couldn't be happier. The Russian ruble is actually stronger now than the U.S. dollar. And he's making a heck of a lot more money to finance this war against Ukraine. So, it's, you know, the people thought the sanctions would punish Russia. It's done just the opposite. So this, this conflict is going to be going on. And now... We are now wanting to get oil from Venezuela to help make up for the shortfall because we can't drill as much as we'd like to here or drill in areas that are more productive. So and this Mitch, is, yes. I, I wanted to add a comment to this that we, we kind of passed over on one of our other slides. <clears throat> um, yesterday morning, I saw um, a, a, a headline, OPEC underproduced its combined output agreement quotas in May 
by one by over 1 million barrels per day, which is the widest gap ever seen. So for some reason, high oil prices right now, the Saudis are not producing more. And Joe Biden's about to go over there and take a trip when he called them a pariah for killing that, that journalist a couple of years ago on the campaign trail. He is now gonna go beg Saudi Arabia and Venezuela for oil when we can produce it here for cheaper and cleaner. Yeah, he'll, he'll probably make a stop in Venezuela, see if he can get more oil from them. So another, you know, a dictator country. So it, it just it just doesn't make sense when we could do this here and it benefits everyone, but it just doesn't fit the narrative. Um, Mike, let's talk a little bit about capitulation on, on this slide. And then the next one, yeah. we have our chart we used from last month. Yeah, there's a couple things that we look at, everyone, when, when it comes to capitulation. And this graph is just one representation of it. So your black lines, the bar graph lines there, are showing you the percentage of S&P 500 companies that are above their 200-day moving average. And as that drops lower and lower, it means the breadth of the market as a whole is getting sold off. Right now, only 15% of S&P 500 companies are above their 200-day average. And you can see how that's been falling over the last few months. So we're not quite there yet, but that signal below 10, 10% means it's 90% of companies on the S&P are below their 200-day moving average. That's one of the capitulation signals that we say, hey, maybe we should look at getting back in now. Yes, and, and we've talked to many of you on, on the call about, and I literally just got off the phone with a client and wanted to send money in today, and I said, no, we're gonna add you to the capitulation list. So this is a chart we used from our last month, and I said, let's just update it so people can see where the market was. And again, this is the third week of May, and the market kind of rallied the last week of May. The VIX index, which is the volatility index, it's long-term average, to put this in context, is 20. Right now, it's at 32. And Mike, I don't know if you've got a print on it now, if you can look at it, and if you can, just speak up. If the S&P volume, this is the ETF, that we hold in, in many of our portfolios. And if you have a volume of over 250 million shares traded, that indicates a big massive dump and sell off. You can see there's been a big increase. Mike talked about the previous slide. We've gone from 31% to 16, so it's moved much slower. The dumb money, stock market participation below 20%. So these are the institutional investors who just say, I can't handle this anymore. Um, I, you know, I just want out. Um, when that gets below 20, that is one of the last signals. Now, not all four of these indicate a capitulation has taken place, and there's other factors, but we look at these four, and what we're trying to share with you on this slide is we're much closer to the bottom now than we were a month or two ago. Please be patient. We have a plan in place. We will recover from this, and the best days of the stock market are right after the capitulation event. So if you sell now or go to cash or make significant changes, you get killed once. When the capitulation event occurs and you're in cash, you get killed twice. And there's no way we can time the market. And this is the best way we can. So just stay fully invested. If you need extra cash, you know, let us know. But I think we're much closer to this capitulation event. Anything you wanna add to that, Mike? Yeah, um, VIX is at uh, close just below 33 today. Okay. And I, we have a chart later on. It jumped up to 80 um, back during that uh, Feb March dip, market dip in 2020. Yeah. So and that's actually um, this next slide here, which is a great go. segue. So this yeah. is the, the VIX index that's kind of the Christmas colors, red and green. It popped a high of 85 in March of 2020 when COVID hit initially. The purple line represents the SP 500. We bought these VIX calls as a way to minimize downside participation, their downside hedge. Historically, we've used put options, but they're four to, four, four to five times as expensive. VIX calls work better. So when we have this capitulation event, these VIX calls we purchased are going to appreciate significantly. We'll sell them, um, and then that will help minimize downside participation. We're hoping for some kind of recovery because we'd like to buy another tranche of these but we just haven't had that happen since we bought it, okay? 
Uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about in the, in the Fed had finally updated this chart. We It wasn't updated uh, uh, until it's January now. Last month it was October, but there's almost $5.2 trillion of cash on the sidelines. And this money is waiting for a uh, like capitulation type event to be deployed when the Fed stops raising interest rates or there's a significant decline of inflation, the Ukraine-Russia war ends some uncertainty becomes certain, then the money will come in. So that's why we think when these events occur, the market's going to respond pretty strongly upwards. We just have to be patient. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about the Fed. It's, they've gotten a lot of notoriety and they have two problems. The first problem they have is credibility. They should have been raising interest rates last year and they're behind. So they're having to raise rates very quickly to get inflation under control. So there's a lot of information on this chart. So let me kind of point out what I want you to look at. The blue line is the Federal Open Market Committee or the Federal Reserve. This is their year in estimates and what they expect rates will be. The green line is what the market expects. So those of you on this call, do you think the market's more intelligent or the Fed? And the answer is the market. Um, it's called the wisdom of crowds. If you ever watched the TV show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And people don't know the answer. They ask the audience for their input. Oftentimes, the audience is correct. So if you look at this, back in April, and we shared this with you, the Fed and the market were basically in agreement about how quickly they should raise rates. But then in May, there was a divergence. The market said, hey, Fed, you know, you got to raise rates quicker and higher then look here at June. Here we are now. There's even more divergence. That was two days ago, Mitch. Yep. That was on Wednesday. That was on on Tuesday before the Fed announcement on Wednesday of how of raising 75 basis points. But if you come over here to the right hand side where this blue arrow is, you can see now they're back in line, but see how much higher the rates are here than they were back in April. So I think what's happening is the Fed recognizes this inflation problem is worse. And the stock market had a real good day yesterday at rally, and it's primarily because the market thought, OK, the Fed's really going to step up and dress this or, or slay this inflation dragon. But then they kind of looked at the data, you know, and they woke up in the morning and say, gosh, the market still got some issues. And that's why we had the, the sell off today. But the other thing I want to point out is look at how the market and the Fed expects to be cutting rates, you know, 23, 24 and so they're expecting a peak in this area now. And the 10-year treasury is around 3.4 something. Uh, and that's where rates probably need to go on the, on the, Fed, uh, on the Fed level uh, to get in line. And, and they're hoping that's will get inflation down to their magical you know, 2% level, which I think is uh, wishful thinking. I really think the long-term inflation rate in this country is going to be 3 to 3.5%. Three We're actually using 3.5% in, in our plans. But the other part of this is when you see rates like this on the 10 year, that means we're much closer to the end of the bond markets uh, neg negativity. Um, so that's the, some of the clients on this call and some of the other clients who've deployed money into municipal bonds. Now it's been a real good time to do that. And we'll find out how accurate we were as, as time goes on. Mike, anything you want to add to that? Um, uh, the 10 year treasury today closed at 3.307%. So if you go on to this next slide, two days ago, I had it at, on the bottom right there, I had the 10 year treasury at 3.44%. So it's definitely bouncing around a lot. It got up as high as 3.48% uh, the other day. Yeah. Um, so that's what the market's saying it's going to do. And this is what the Fed's saying. It's another way to show you guys what that dot plot chart was in the last in the last um, showing. But we just jumped up to that 150, 175 basis point, the blue column there. So you have meetings in at the end of July. Each each line going across is another one of their meeting dates. So the top one is July 27th. The next one is September 21st, and then it takes you to November, and it shows you the odds of each each co each column is 25 basis points or a quarter of a percent so what it means when they're skipping and they're jumping 50 plus basis points each time it means they're trying to be more aggressive and and try to catch up with that inflation so right now there's the 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 markets are showing a hundred percent chance 
of a 50 basis point rate hike six weeks from now and 12 weeks from now, another 50 basis point rate hike. So that's gonna put us up uh, above two and a half percent. But again, still behind what the 10 year treasury is saying it should be right now at three and a quarter to three and a half percent. Yeah, and, and people say, well, that's interesting, Mitch and Mike, what does this mean to me? Uh, for people that have revolving debt or business loans that's, pay, that's uh, priced based on the prime rate that banks charge, those rates go up every time the Fed raises interest rates. Mm -hmm. For people that have credit card debt, the rates will go up. Now, if you're paying 20 plus percent, hopefully no one on this call is, it doesn't, it's not going to move the needle. But that's where the big impact is going to be. But for, for middle Americans and lower middle class Americans, this is incredibly expensive because a lot of these people are having used debt to make ends meet to pay for, for gas and groceries. And again, this administration is just punishing the people that can least afford to be punished. And I think you know, that's why you're seeing this sentiment of Joe Biden and some of the worst in history. And I think that's why there's going to be a significant change in November. Um, I, I hope okay. he... Yes. We're about floating, floating mortgage rates, float, floating yeah. loans, mortgage yeah, rates. Absolutely. And we'll have a slide here. We'll, we'll talk about, about how much mortgage rates ha have gone up. So you know, I talked about consumer sentiment. It hit a record low. This just came out in the last day or two, 50.2, the lowest it's ever been since 71 when this chart was taken. But what I want to focus on is not just how bad people feel, but what happens 12 months later? And then if you look at the 12 month returns on the S&P, you can see the returns have always been double digit. And normally the worse it is, the better the returns have been. So that's again, why we're saying this is not gonna be going on where this isn't 2000 through 2002 or 08 or 09. It's gonna be uh, sharp, and it's, but it's gonna be shallow in terms of the recession. So just be patient. Um, so what can move the markets higher? So this is, uh, some of these are, are going to be very difficult. One is, if Russia decides to end the, the war in Ukraine and then the sanctions get lift, lifted, you know, Russian oil gets put back in Europe, it, you add a bunch of supply to the marketplace. Now, for Putin and the war in Russia, he has to have a defined victory because if he doesn't have a defined victory in his mind, he's assassinated. So that's probably not likely. Biden decides to reverse course and not follow the Green New Deal Bible and goes back to the Trump era policies on fossil fuels or tells the ESG crowd to knock it off and leave fossil fuels alone. That's not going to happen. The only item on the three bullet points here is the supply chain unwinds itself quicker than we anticipate. All these dots here represent the container ships off the coast of China. Last month, they were much. Uh, it was much harder to, to see them. Now you see some water between them. And China's zero COVID policy has really impacted their ability to ship goods. But this, this area will end, and we actually see inventory builds in some retailers. We talked about Target and Walmart. Um, I think a real critical number that's going to come out here in the next week or so is Amazon's numbers, because Amazon is kind of a proxy for the retail customer. If that number is way off, I think you're probably going to see the market go down because they recognize the consumer has pulled in and will probably end up showing a negative number for second quarter GDP and thus the definition of a recession, two negative quarters back to back. Hey, Mitch. Uh -huh. um, so my whole purpose with that slide, I just wanted to, to, to tell people. I'm okay with a little more cash right now. Uh, Mitch was saying, you know, we normally keep between a two and 5% and cash position, five being a little bit heavier. Um, we just went from nine to 15%. And this slide is to say, it's not a 50-50 toss up which direction the market goes for us. Yes, it could go up, but I think the path of least resistance is down, which is why I'm okay holding some cash right now. That, that's the whole whole purpose of the slide. And above all of this, you still have, let's say it does go up, that gives the Fed even more incentive to put its foot on the neck of the market and keep crushing demand so that this inflation can come down. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, we expect interest rates to slow the real estate market than they have. 30-year um, rates, I, I saw a handle of 6.2 earlier. This is fluid. I've seen some as high as 7 the important point is at the beginning of the year, that was 3%. And for first time home buyers or lower income people, 
this higher mortgage rate basically will keep them out of the housing market. They're going to have to rent, you know, for a long period of time. It, it's just incredibly frustrating. And for people who overpaid for houses in 2021, who especially have floating rate mortgages, when their rates reset, those houses are going to get incredibly expensive. And houses went up 20 percent over the past year and all of us here in Texas and other places around the country, we're going to pay a lot higher real estate taxes. And I know the city of Dallas and, uh, and Fort Worth and the other areas are going to be ecstatic with the amount of tax revenue they're going to be collecting from us. But if you look at this chart here, just see this hockey stick climb of mortgage rates. It just indicates pain. Um, I, we don't think we're going to have the real estate blood in the streets like we've had in cryptocurrencies and stocks because of Dodd-Frank in, 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 before 08 and 09, if, if you had a pulse, you didn't get one mortgage, you got three. Now, because of Dodd-Frank, you actually have to qualify for the mortgage. And I think that will prevent you know, a major housing meltdown. Plus, corporate America has now entered the fray and one out of seven houses sold last year was sold to a corporate institution. I think part of it, and this is just my theory, they can't get any money on the bond market. They want to have portfolios to generate cash. So they're basically creating huge rental property portfolios that they can sell to investors. All right. Um, one of the areas, and we won't spend a lot of time on this. This is economic, um, modern monetary theory, MMT. There is a contingent of, of, of economists and, and people that think MMT is the new magic monetary theory. It basically says you can print as much money as you want. There's no repercussions. Inflation is not going to be that bad. Well, it's a flawed theory. Even uh, Paul Klugman, who's who's won the Nobel Prize, he writes for the New York Times. He he didn't like this either. And you can just see the purchasing power of a dollar from 71 till the day, how it's being eroded. And then you see the gross public debt. Um, some of our webinars, and we've used this in meetings in years past. If you look at the debt of uh, the debt to GDP of Japan, it's about 260 percent. You know, we're probably about 110. And I'm concerned that some of the MMT people and our political leaders and elite are thinking, "Heck, we got money to spend. We don't." And this inflation problem is 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 basically shows why this does not work. Um, so if we shift gears to our, our our portfolios that generate income, even with the market being down, we've still been able to produce the income we promised we would. Um, stock income is our flagship. We produce 1% per month. We did 3% last year in the trailing 12 months. You can see what these numbers are. I know people that are in Advantage or Advantage Plus and stock income, yes, those portfolios are down, but one of the main reasons you own them is for the income they produce. And we're not annuitizing the portfolio, we're protecting that principle and we're generating cash from it. Now that the positions will recover, especially after a capitulation event, but I would just say be patient. If you have worries or concerns, please reach out to us. And a lot of you have over the last week or so, but we'd love to hear from you. And there's more information we can share with you. Now, um, Mike, you want to talk a bit about the specifics of what's going on in our stock income portfolio? Yeah, so um, uh, someone called me up yesterday and said, how have you guys been doing with this market just getting beat up like it is? Um, right now, that uh, that yellow line there for, for 617, that's at about 132 right now, 1.32%. If the market's just drifting down, we don't have to buy back positions to, to hold on to them. So all we're doing is just putting cash in your pocket. Good news is we're able to keep putting that cash in your pocket. Bad news is, is that nest egg is getting squeezed. So um, what you're seeing is that that nest egg during the first parts of the year, Feb, March, April, where we were having to buy back some securities to kind of hang on to our cash. Um, I, I'm sorry use some of that cash to hang on to our securities. And then you see May and June hit where the markets have just been falling. You can see that blue line on the chart is our average nest egg size that we're using to generate income. But as that nest egg income went down, I mean, uh, size of the nest egg went down, we were able to generate a lot of cash and hold on to it. So that's why you're seeing that real big number there for, for May. And again, it doesn't, prevent losses it's just a way to pad downside movements and then as things move up again 
we try to maintain the positions as best as possible so that you participate in that upside move as well. So yeah. that's what's happening in, in the markets right now. Yeah, Mike, you want to explain the EXP to people what that is? Oh, um, okay. So, so the the last two columns there are our portfolios return versus the S and P expiration to expiration. A general expiration is a regular expiration is the third Friday of each month. So this Friday will be so tomorrow will be the seventeenth. It's the third Friday of the month. That's when you have a lot of options liquidity. Options expire tomorrow, and so these numbers here are through this past week so this is through the 10th um you see the s p barely up 0 0.09 percent and our portfolio was down 20 basis points and then we have the extra cash we generated 1.22 percent yeah. so as of right now we only have 50 percent of the portfolio exposed everything else has been covered and we'll probably close that out for a penny or two tomorrow and be and be done with the month and then ship everyone's cash out to them sure and, and speaking of cash, uh, I've had some people ask us about I bonds, and this is something you can do with some of your excess cash at your house. We can't sell this to you, offer it to you, but you can purchase it. And you can go to this site right here, www.treasurydirect.gov. You only you only can buy ten thousand dollars electronically of I bonds, so you and your spouse could buy twenty. You also can purchase the paper bonds and buy additional five thousand. But what's really great about these, they have a yield of 9.62%. And you can buy the bonds at that rate through October 2022. At the beginning of the year, I think it's around 7%. So as inflation has gone up, so has the yield on these. So everyone on this call, I'm sure has excess cash laying around. I would recommend buying some of these and look at it as a CD type instrument. Now you have to hang on to them for at least a year and five years to get all of your interest. But it, it's a good way to make some of your cash that you don't want to play in the market, earn some money, and they, they're guaranteed not to lose money, assuming our government doesn't go out of business, which if they, that does, we have bigger problems. So uh, the last slide we'll cover is what we can expect going forward. And there's more downside risk ahead, and there's no rescue for the markets being anticipated in the near term. There's no white knight. There's not the political stomach to make the changes. They're going to die on their sword, literally. While prices are going to remain high, at least for the midterm elections, maybe through 2024, inflation should have subside. But the Fed policies are going to probably crush the markets into a recession, albeit probably a light one. The, the Russia-Ukraine fiasco may not be enough to deter a China-Taiwan invasion. Um, now, we were talking about this six, seven months ago, but because of inflation, the markets, we haven't talked a lot about China and Taiwan. And Mike, if you want to spend a, a few, few, a couple minutes about what you know about Taiwan and China. Yeah, uh, so China has ha had its eye on Taiwan and beating them into submission and taking them under their wing for some time. And President Xi thinks he's the one to do that. He is coming up for reelection uh, this fall. And um, once that occurs, I, I think he sees the Biden administration as not being a deterrent for them to take action against Taiwan. But I do think they see the fiasco with Russia invading Ukraine and what happened there as a bit of a deterrent. I just don't know if it's enough of a deterrent. But um, I heard it quoted that Taiwan is like a hornet's nest. If China invades them, China will win that battle, but it will drastically hurt China. Uh, Taiwan is extremely disciplined. They have, uh, they're, they're extremely well prepared and they have decent weapons stockpiled. So they will definitely punch back. And if China does this, I think they may underestimate them. And you think the global supply chain is constrained right now. If China is in an extended battle with Taiwan and then everyone's throwing sanctions onto China, um, it could definitely throw the market into a, into a whirlwind to the downside. Yeah, and, and the other part of this is the Economist, which I read, which is a, a, a left-leaning uh, publication. They're against China doing that as well, and I think the China PR hit would probably be so great that they may, if they take ta ta Taiwan back, they may lose the war. But the China economy is in worse shape than ours is right now, and I don't know if they can economically afford 
this kind of prolonged battle with Taiwan. So I'm more in the camp that's probably less likely to happen now than it would have been six months or a year ago. We'll see what happens, but um, I, I don't think it's it's going to happen because I don't think China's in a real strong position right now. So uh, that completes our webinar. We'll go to uh, Q&A and we'll go ahead and oh, I'll turn off the recording. And if you guys want to ask questions, you can. If you want to type one in, uh, go ahead.